Okay, let's start this video with something a little bit more unusual. Here's a picture of a boy sleeping on ice in 1890. A Kodak picture taken nearly 135 years ago featuring an unknown boy sleeping on ice with a caption simply reading, oh. And the reason I wanted to start with this picture, apart from it obviously being kind of random and a little bit unusual, is actually because this is the main topic we're discussing today. We're tackling a question that seems super simple, but has actually puzzled scientists for centuries. Why is ice, water ice, so slippery? And though this is basically a kind of a universal experience that I think most of us are more or less familiar with, for nearly 200 years there was a somewhat common explanation for all of this, based on some of the previous ideas we thought we knew about ice and based on some of the previous misconceptions, because apparently for over 200 years we were completely incorrect. And so after two centuries, this relatively new study from the Sarlan University by Ashraf Attila and the team you see right here, possibly discovered that ice is slippery for an entirely different reason and nobody considered this until now. And so this is actually a really groundbreaking discovery, assuming of course future studies can confirm this by conducting additional experiments. And so let's I guess dive into this somewhat bizarre idea, an idea that's going to change our perspective of ice forever, and uncover the surprisingly complex science behind all of this that has now been explored through molecular studies. But I guess so let's start with some of the previous assumptions we had about ice, and of course something we know about it just based on our daily experiences. And so what exactly makes ice so slippery? So what makes you slip when you step on ice? Or what allows us to glide on skates, feeling the thrill of speed? Well, obviously both of these situations suggest that ice seems to have incredibly low friction. But what's really causing this low friction, or this slipperiness, or I guess to be more exact, how exactly was this explained previously? Well, interestingly, every single search I've conducted so far pretty much resulted in the same response, which seems to match the exactly same explanations I've seen in most textbooks and have heard from most professors. For a very long time, scientists always focused on one thing, liquid water. As in the surface of ice, which is solid, starts to form extremely thin layers of liquid water, which in theory can act as a lubricant between your shoe and ice, or between ice skates and the surface you're skating on. But this was a little bit confusing because it wasn't clear how the water would form even when the temperature was well below freezing. As in, in even really cold conditions you can actually still skate on ice, even though technically none of this should be producing liquid water. And so for almost two centuries there was this one leading explanation, and it technically centered on two main ideas. The first idea here is pressure melting, and this was an idea that was first suggested by James Thomson, the guy you see right here. Thompson was a British engineer and a physicist, but he was more famous for being the older brother of Lord Kelvin, the guy you see right here, who obviously has temperature units named after him. And so nearly 200 years ago, James Thompson proposed that when you apply pressure to ice, like when you for example step on it, the pressure lowers the melting point of ice, causing an extremely thin layer of water to form on top. So I guess here you can kind of think of maybe squeezing some kind of an ice cube and feeling the wetness of the cube on your hand. And this theory was used to explain things like for example skating, because in this case the skates would form pressure on top of ice, which would then be lubricated by liquid water. This is an explanation I've heard in pretty much all physics classes during all of my schooling years. But the second idea was known as the frictional heating, referring to the rubbing motion between your shoe or the ski and the ice, which would then produce heat, and the heat in this case would then melt a tiny surface of ice on top, once again producing a tiny puddle of water. And so this melted water on top of ice was the main explanation for the lubrication and for why we slip or why skates work on the surface. And for practically two centuries, because it kind of I guess made sense, this was never really questioned. Except that there was one problem. Scientists had a lot of trouble directly proving this with experiments. As a matter of fact, some of the more recent experiments from the last 10 years could not explain exactly what's happening here, assuming the pressure idea or the friction idea were actually correct. For example, for pressure melting to explain skiing at, for example, minus 20 Celsius, the actual contact area between the ski and the ice would have to be incredibly, almost unbelievably small. And that does not seem to be very realistic. Whereas for frictional heating, experiments with very sensitive equipment could not detect any significant warming on snow surfaces, even when things were sliding at a very high velocity. 
and that meant that there was basically no evidence for any kind of frictional heating. And that meant that even though technically water should be making things slippery, how exactly it did this was obviously unclear. And especially when things are super cold. So basically, how exactly would water even stay liquid when temperatures are super cold? Which suggests that either there was something else going on here, or we were simply missing a crucial piece of the puzzle. And that's where this new research kind of comes in. In this research, they used molecular simulations, basically super powerful computer models that let us physically zoom in and see what's happening at the atomic level, to study how objects interact with ice surfaces in order to understand how molecules themselves would actually change. And what they discovered was indeed kind of mind-bending. The simulations here show that ice surfaces can physically liquefy without actually melting in the traditional sense. In other words, they don't need to get hotter or pressurized. Instead, the ice seems to physically transform through a process they now refer to as cold displacement-driven amorphization. But what exactly does this mean? Okay, let's talk about this unusual process. At the core of this idea, we have molecular dipoles. So I guess imagine a water molecule, H2O. It's not perfectly balanced and it has an electric charge. One end has a slightly positive charge, the other one has a slightly negative charge. This gives this molecule polarity. So in some sense you can think of it as a tiny magnet. And in solid ice these water molecules are very neatly arranged in a highly ordered crystalline structure. So here everything is perfectly aligned. Now when something else, like another object, maybe a shoe, maybe a ski, or an ice skate, touches this ice, it's not primarily the pressure pushing down or the heat from rubbing that causes the slippery layer, it's the interaction between the dipoles in the contacting surface and the dipoles in the ice molecules. Or just to rephrase this, these tiny molecular magnets start pushing and pulling on each other at the very surface of ice. And this direct interaction creates what physicists call frustration. Essentially, these competing forces prevent the ice molecules at the surface from staying in their perfect ordered crystalline structure. And it's the disruption in this case that causes the ice at the very surface to become disordered, amorphous, and eventually liquid-like. So here it has nothing to do with melting or pressure, it just simply changes its structure because of these direct molecular interactions. And importantly, this is a cold process. It does not require a lot of energy or a lot of temperature and can actually happen in very cold conditions. As a matter of fact, if you'd like to learn more about bizarre states of ice and a lot of discoveries about amorphous ice, check out some of the previous videos in the description. Because in a nutshell, what we have on the surface here represents very bizarre forms of ice we've discovered in a lot of different objects in the solar system, such as various comets, asteroids, and moons of various planets. But here on Earth, ice forms this bizarre hexagonal crystalline structure that doesn't seem to exist in a lot of other places in the universe. Yet right there, right on the surface, this cold process forms this bizarre ice we usually find in space, which now suddenly becomes super slippery. And in this case, the researchers using various simulations do provide us with a lot of powerful evidence. And so here they observe these localized zones of disorder forming at the ice interface even in super cold conditions as low as 10 Kelvin, minus 263 Celsius. So kind of like what we do actually find in outer space. And these disorder zones then spread out as the sliding continues, eventually making the entire surface slippery. But they also discovered something else about this unusual phenomenon and about how these bizarre layers seem to grow. Its width seems to increase proportionally to the square root of this slit distance. And this square root relationship is somewhat important. It tells us that the transformation is displacement-driven, meaning that the molecules are physically pushed and displaced by sliding motion as they're forced out of their neat crystalline positions, creating this amorphous layer. And because this cold amorphization seems to happen at extremely low temperatures, this directly challenges old assumptions that below minus 40 Celsius or below minus 40 Fahrenheit, a lubricating film cannot exist and ice would no longer be slippery, because it's basically too cold to melt. That's once again something that I've read in a lot of textbooks in the past. As a matter of fact, in their study, the coldest ice crystals actually amorphize fastest, or about 6 times as fast, at super low temperatures of 10 Kelvin compared to minus 10 Celsius. And so, in super cold conditions, ice becomes slippery much faster. But at the same time, at these incredibly low temperatures, this film would also be incredibly thick and very sticky, kind of resembling some kind of a super cold honey, making things like, for example, skiing, 
practically impossible. And so the main conclusion from the study is that even though the film in this case still forms, in super cold temperatures it seems to also acquire additional effects such as stickiness. Although I guess the key point is that the film does form, which is of course one of the major discoveries here. And so if it's not about melting, why does friction still decrease when temperature gets warmer? Well here the study explains that while the amorphization process itself might be faster at colder temperatures, what's known as the effective viscosity of the amorphous layer is much much higher when it's cold. Once again, just to rephrase this, in much much lower temperatures, this amorphous layer on top becomes much more resistant to flow, leading to much higher friction. But as the temperature increases even slightly, the amorphous layer becomes less viscous, allowing for much easier sliding. And on top of this, the type of surface you're sliding on also seems to matter a lot. Here the simulations show that smooth and hydrophobic or water repelling surfaces seem to lead to much lower friction coefficients. So for example, a water repelling surface seems to cut the friction in half compared to water attracting ones. And that's because when we use hydrophobic or water repellent surfaces, water generally can slip much easier on them and there seems to be less energy loss due to various stress fluctuations. And so in practice, if you want something super slippery, you basically need an extremely smooth water repellent surface at temperatures just below zero. This will give the amorphous layer the least possible viscosity and will also make it super slippery. But I guess what does all of this mean? Well here the main idea is that this particular study fundamentally challenges our understanding of why ice is slippery to begin with and provides a very intriguing molecular analysis that has not really been considered before. With the conclusion being that it's not really about melting in the traditional sense and doesn't involve actual friction or pressure, but instead seems to involve rearrangement of molecules that produce an unusual phase of ice that we know exists in outer space. And though in this case there's still, I guess, a liquid layer on top, in reality it's not that it's liquid and is not necessarily formed by pressure or frictional heating, it's really more of an amorphous ice formed as a result of a very specific molecular interaction that seems to be the primary driver for disrupting the crystalline structure. And so I guess it's more accurate to call this layer a liquid-like state or a very specific phase of amorphous ice that makes interactions incredibly slippery. And on top of this, the cold does not seem to stop it, with the process of amorphization happening at extremely low temperatures, even when heat-based or pressure-based melting should be impossible. With this particular study basically showing us that science is always evolving, and even when well-established theories and propositions, especially those taught in schools for basically centuries, appear to be correct at first. And in this case it seems to challenge most of this by using these new advanced simulations. Reminding us of course that even the world around us still has so much to teach us, even in what seems to be very simple scenarios and simple phenomena like sleeping on ice. But because this is such a grand proposition, we obviously now need more studies and additional experimental evidence. And so until we have even more evidence, at least for now we're going to assume that this is a really cool explanation, but it's still somewhat theoretical. And so next time you slip on ice, or next time you pick up an ice cube and it slips out of your hands, remember that it's probably not because of heat and not because of some kind of a pressure, but really because it's producing these very bizarre amorphous layers on the surface of ice caused by very specific molecular dipoles creating a very specific layer that then starts to repel everything else. And so quite an intriguing atomic level explanation for something that we basically take for granted. But I guess what do you think about this? How likely is this to be correct? Or have you heard of other explanations for why we sleep on ice? We'll definitely come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access and a few secret videos. Alternatively, you can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.